Can you believe that we are about to approach the holidays? Many of us, that is, around the world. I'm in the United States, and I get to tell you, I'm I am recording this conscious commentary in a in a hurry <laughs> because as soon as I finish up, I've got to prepare for Thanksgiving. Hi everyone, Alexis Brooks here from Higher Journeys, and I am back with another episode of Conscious Commentary. I hope you all are doing well wherever you may be on this little blue, beautiful planet. I'm going to get right into the talk today because there's a lot to cover. This is a talk, by the way, that I am so delighted to say that I will soon be presenting in its entirety in Australia. That's right, folks. Higher Journeys on the road again. I'm going to Australia this time. Uh, I don't believe I'll be filming shows there, but I will be giving a presentation in Uluru, to be exact. It's taken me quite some time to get that pronunciation right. Uluru, Australia, right smack in the middle of this big country. You know, Uluru, uh, I have to to talk a little bit about it because it's so exciting. It's often referred to as the spiritual heart of Australia. And for good reason, I'm learning. It's a sacred site. Uh, It's known to both locals, uh, the indigenous peoples, of course, the aboriginals, and others really from all over the world. And I am uh, fast becoming acquainted with this absolutely precious space, seeing that I will be going in January to give to give a talk. I want to give a shout out to uh, Cosmic Consciousness Conference, which is where I will be speaking and all the folks that are working so hard to put together a brilliant schedule for us. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit later, maybe even talk a little bit more about Uluru. How was I pronouncing it before? Aluru, I think. And they got me straight real quick. So before I go, I will make sure to to have that down pat. But listen, I want to get right into what we're going to be discussing today on Conscious Commentary because it is related. We're talking, we're talking about the idea that ET contact may be indeed a mass phenomenon. I have talked about this before. I've had I've broached the subject before. Uh, both in uh, previous conscious commentary as well as with several of my guests, because it is something that I have been keenly interested in in looking into. It's a difficult topic to tackle, certainly from um, an evidence perspective. Well, I'm not going to say evidence. It's hard. It's obviously hard to prove. We we don't even know in terms of those individuals that are having conscious contact can't really get our arms around what those numbers look like. I know it is quite large. And again, these are the people that are willing to come out and say, yes, I am an experiencer. But what about those that are experiencers and are aware of it that haven't come out? Moreover, what about those who may be unconscious about their contact that may be completely oblivious? I want to go into this a little bit because, and I got to tell you that I'm just going to give you a little taste of this, this talk that I'll be doing in Australia, because there are so many entry points as I dig in, and I'm still in the research phase of putting this talk together. But as I do so, I am quickly realizing that the rabbit hole gets infinitely deeper and deeper as we really look into the prospect of whether humanity at large are experiencers as a collective. Let me get into several entry points that I'm going to be covering in my talk, just a few, because I think these are these are these are major areas that can be uh, explored. And this I know I've talked about before, and that has to do with phobias, not just phobias, but strange phobias, for instance, the fear of clowns. Ever since Mary Rodwell, who you all know, and I have talked about uh, ever since she brought it up, I should say, and not just on my show, but in her research, this idea that in some cases, the fear of clowns, I wish I had that there is a name for it, for this particular phobia uh, that maybe I can list. I can't recall it now. It's, it's increasing, by the way. Uh, but in some cases, Mary's uh, thoughts may be that clowns may be representing a sort of screen memory for another phenomenon or another type of being. I think this is really what kind of tipped me off into this direction of looking further into the idea that more people uh, may be having some form of contact with non-human intelligence, but it is being masked in other ways. Fear of doctors. Let's look at a few of these phobias that I'm going to be addressing. 
Fear of doctors. Now, I know at first blush, you may be thinking, well, I can think of reasons to be afraid of going to the doctor. But there is something, uh, such a thing as iatrophobia, a fear of doctors. And I have to say, this this is something that I, I, I talked to my colleague uh, recently, M- Miguel Mendoza, about. He brought it up to me. I'm going to give a shout out to him. That having a fear, fear of getting on a table, what do we uh, consider synonymous with the abduction phenomenon in many cases? And that is an examination, being put on a cold table on a craft and being examined. I think it's something worthy of looking at. I don't know how common iatrophobia is, but I dare say, if you put that, if, if that perhaps is a clue, it would probably account for quite a number of individuals. And again, where is the origin of the phobia coming from? So we're going to be looking at that as well as other phobias. I have one. I don't know that I'm ready to share it yet. I will eventually, (laughs) because it's a little silly at first blush. But you know, when you have a phobia that particularly other people can't understand why on earth, why would you be afraid of a clown? They're supposed to be fun. As an example, you have to ask the question yourself, why would I? Where did this come from? We're also going to be looking at in this talk, and I'm really just giving you an overview, unrelated paranormal encounters. Now, I want to stop here for a minute because this this whole idea of the uh, paranormal phenomena, anything from ghostly apparitional activity hauntings uh, to ESP, to out-of-body experiences, things that are under the umbrella of paranormal, have been uh, historically separated from the field of ufology. And I still find that so perplexing. First of all, I, I have to say, that I would argue that the, the whole word and the way we use it, paranormal, not normal, may be a misnomer because I have said this before. I do indeed feel that the metaphysical is what g- gives rise to the physical, the esoteric to the exoteric. And therefore, those things that we consider to be paranormal that obviously don't fit uh, our criteria of physics that we still abide by may be not the epiphenomenon but the phenomenon that gives rise to the physical world. So there's my little two cents on the paranormal world, because it is ubiquitous. I would dare say most, if not all people have had a brush with what would be considered paranormal, at least once in their lives. So you've got a a bunch of things going on with uh, unrelated, what I'm going to call unrelated paranormal encounters, encounters that at uh, first blush wouldn't necessarily look as if they are related directly to a contact encounter. And yet, it can be argued that there are really no distinct lines of demarcation. All of this phenomena is somehow related. There is a common thread. Consciousness is an aspect that's being talked about more and more that gives rise to all of these experiences, including the contact phenomenon. So we're going to get into that. And by the way, I want to say as far as paranormal encounters are concerned, certainly the phenomenon known as the out-of-body experience or OBE is one that I have covered uh, uh, quite uh, frequently, particularly with uh, my colleague William Buhlman, OBE expert. In fact, I'm, I'm actually reading Passport to the Cosmos right now by John, the late John Mack. Oh my gosh, brilliant, brilliant. I so wish he was still with us. But he references uh, out-of-body experiences relating to the contact phenomenon and actually cited uh, Buhlman's work in, uh, in his book Passport to the Cosmos. So we've got a whole cornucopia of entry points. And I'm just talking about you know, a couple of things here. In the talk, I'll be going into uh, intricate detail as to what some of those uh, th- those entry points may entail. Uh, obsession with either television programs or films or both that that uh, uh, that have an alien or UFO theme, although uh, portrayed in a fictional context. When you find yourself having to watch Ancient Aliens, can't miss an, an episode. Or were you a Trekkie? <laughs> I wasn't, interestingly enough. I don't. I can't recall one episode of watching Star Trek as a child, but we know that there are a lot of people that are habitual Star Trek watchers to this day, and all of the all, all of the iterations of Star Trek that have come out since. 
well, why are you so interested? And I bet if you were to ask the average person, they, they'd just come up with, well, I'd like to, to hear, I, I like what the holodeck look like. Well, have you ever been on a holodeck? You know, I'm saying that with a little bit of a smile on my face, but at the same time, in many uh, contact or uh, cases of individuals being taken onto craft, they talk quite frequently about being allowed to operate the craft, to to learn the controls, you know. That's come up a lot, by the way. I just read a story, do you know the name Lynn Buchanan? The gentleman, the, the well-known remote viewer and contactee, I guess he would later admit, who was portrayed uh, in the movie Men Who Stare at Goats. His character was played by George Clooney. That, my understanding is, is based on Lynn Buchanan's story. And he, uh, his account is so amazing that he actually gave in a book that I'm actually a bookmate with him in, which is called We Are the Disclosure. I know I'm kind of bouncing all over the place, but I'm trying to draw a bunch of, bring a bunch of things together. But in that uh, very, very lucid account that he gave uh, in We Are the Disclosure, he talked about how he discovered that he was a contactee through a, a very unusual trigger or a, words that were spoken. I'm not going to get into the story because it's, I'd actually encourage you to go get that book and, and read, read, read the whole book, of course, but particularly read the account of Lynn Buchanan and how he goes into the, describes the odyssey and the revelation of his own contact experience unbeknownst to him. And what was the trigger? So we're going to be talking about triggers in this talk as well. We'll be looking at certain triggers and they can be the darndest things, whether it's a word or, or phrase or question that's posed that may bring back a vague recollection. Very much like a dream. You know how you have a dream and dreams are notorious to be forgotten so quickly. Oftentimes the moment we wake up, unless there, there's some dreams that are the exception to the rule. I know for me, Oftentimes I will be going about my day and out of the blue in what seems to be the most arbitrary way, I will have just a little bleed through, what I would call bleed through of, oh my gosh, I dreamt that, um, oh, I don't know, I dreamt that I was I was flying <laughs> or, or something like that. I'm just making that up. But the way the recollection comes in, and it, it may not even be a, a trigger word, it may just be you're being in a certain place at a certain time and all of a sudden some detail will come flooding back seemingly arbitrarily. It could very well be the case that if we are to learn that we have had contact that we'll get occasional bleed throughs, or there'll be some familiarity of a place that we are in, or a song that we hear that reminds us of something vaguely familiar, but we just can't put our put our finger on it. This is going to be, uh, you know, certain certain subjects look, we're not out to prove anything. This is one of those things that absolutely can't be proved. I don't know that there's anything under the umbrella of what we call paranormal or you know, non-ordinary states of consciousness, the broad field of consciousness and metaphysics uh, in this context can be proven. But I'm going to say what I've said. I'm quoting uh, Dean Radin once again, Mr. Mr. Radin, Dr. Radin, please forgive me, but this was just such a brilliant quote. <laughs> the only place you will find proof is in mathematics and in alcohol, quote, unquote. And so therefore, this talk that I'll be giving, I will not attempt to prove anything, but really just raise the question, wow, are many more of us experiencers and we don't know it? And if so, how might we know? And if we don't know it, why? Who's keeping it from us? Is it us? I'm also going to be getting into the the psychology of, of this whole idea. How much of our reality are we perhaps keeping from ourselves? Is it a form of cognitive dissonance? Is it a, a sort of defense mechanism for, for keeping our status quo worldview intact. I do believe there's a psychological component here. If in fact, there are individuals walking the planet right now that may be completely oblivious to 
an encounter that they had? Is there something in our psyche that's preventing us from knowing what is really happening? Very similar, I would say, to uh, to reincarnation, if indeed it does exist, and we have had multiple lifetimes. Why is it that we can't recall previous incarnations, by and large? Now, we know that there are individuals who do indeed, in fact, children, many children, who can recall very, very intricate details of previous lifetimes. But by and large, assuming that reincarnation does occur multiple times at that, why can't we recall? If you're enjoying this episode and want to get more conversations about all things intriguing, inspiring, and unusual, be sure to subscribe to Higher Journeys on YouTube. And once you do, don't forget to hit that notification bell to receive an announcement as soon as a new episode is posted. And now, back to our show. This is a big question that's been debated. But I would dare say that the, the, the question deserves to be asked within this context as well. If we have been in contact with non-human intelligence, with some form of alien intelligence, but we're unaware of it, why? Is it us keeping it from us? Is it them? So we'll be looking at that as well. The other area that I, I hope to go into uh, in some detail, at least touch on, is looking at this from a Jungian perspective. Carl Jung, of course, the Swiss psychologist and his brilliant and often esoteric approach to understanding human, uh, the human psychology through the collective unconscious. I'm p- still kind of playing with this idea. But again, when you look at human consciousness as somehow being tethered to one another, you look at what we call non-local consciousness and the fact that at some level we are all inextricably linked to it the field of which we're, we're all information and experience lie. And I ask the question, even if one person, just one, and we know it's many more, have had contact with non-human intelligence, that experience lives within the repository of that field. And if we're all connected to it, then at some level, we're all affected by it. By default, we can tap into that experience Ergo, at some level, we're all participating in that experience. This is going to be a, a tough one, <laughs> but I think, it's, I think it's definitely worth thinking about because we are all connected. Even if you take something called the butterfly effect in which you, you do a certain act, say a certain thing, behave a certain way. Now, obviously, there's criteria that's involved in how the butterfly effect works, but essentially, the idea is that something performed in one location will somehow be picked up in others in other locations. There have been other names for it, of course. But again, my sense is that looking at all of this, and we'll be looking at more, that many, many, many more people walking this planet right now I'm talking people that may not may not be showing any uh, any elements that I had just brought up in, in terms of phobias or or obsession with watching programs having to do with UFOs or you know um, any of the these things. Even the most unsuspecting individual, even those who may ridicule the subject, make fun of it, make light of it. Is this some form? perhaps in some cases of denial, of protection, of keeping our worldview intact or that individual's worldview intact. I'm going to be speaking with a couple of experiencers that will be incorporated into the presentation that were once that type of person. Not only did they not fall into any of these uh, curious clues or entry points, but they laughed at the subject of, of ufology didn't didn't give it the time of day, but something happened at some point that triggered them. I'm thinking of one person right now who was, I think, working with a bunch of individuals at a job. He had an interest in the field of ufology and had no problem talking about it. Well, apparently the individuals that he worked with all just gave him a hard time. I don't know what type of job he worked at, uh, worked in, perhaps in a factory. I, I don't know. But 
there were about 100 individuals, he said, that had absolutely no, um, not only did they not have an interest in the subject, but they thought he was a, he was a lun- lunatic <laughs> for being interested in it. And, you know, the, the, the kicker is, at after a certain period of time, he continued to talk about his interest in the subject. And I believe 90 of the 100 individuals he worked with came to him privately and said, hey, got to tell you something. I um, I think I've been contacted. I just couldn't say anything to anyone. So we know full well that there is such a fear of ridicule historically um, prevalent in our society, particularly Western society. Can't talk about that. They'll think I'm crazy. So they may be the biggest antagonists, those themselves that are experiencers. Am I making the point here? I think it's a lot bigger of a phenomenon than we know. So this is where I'm going to be. This is where my head is is at right now and will be for the foreseeable future until I present this talk and and probably uh, uh, thereafter because it's something. And I I think that there will be, as I say, epiphanies along the way that I myself will have. I'll be talking about my own experience, by the way, in that talk. I haven't talked about it a lot. Um, mainly because I'm interviewing other people. But I do think uh, that it is apropos in this in this venue. So I will be speaking a little bit more about that. And really, my own discovery in in uh, looking at this, I I, I thought that uh, I would be remiss if I if I didn't. So that uh, certainly will be included. If you have any questions, certainly any comments about what we're talking about here, and I've just obviously scratch the surface, but I want to open that door for you as always to ask yourself the question. Let's not push it. Let's not, let's not look for it. You know, if it's not there, it's not there. But have you had contact and you may not know it? Start thinking about that. Most importantly, here's the thing I want to say in closing. Why, why are we even talking about this? What? So what? I'm a contactee. Now what? Well, let's imagine that if, let's say that this may indeed be a mass phenomenon, and when I say mass, I'm not talking about all seven and a half billion individuals on the planet, but enough to be considered a mass phenomenon. What are the implications for how our paradigm would change? You know, this whole zeitgeist that we're living in right now of divisiveness that I have never seen to this extent, would that change in an instant division? if we're all connected by this common thread, I think that if nothing else, looking at the implications for this revelation, if it's to be, are huge. We will have to rewrite our history and we certainly will have to shift our present. So I'll be talking about that as well. Let me hear from you. Facebook, of course, uh, you can email me at Higher Journeys and uh, please feel free to comment on your thoughts on this conscious commentary. Now, a few announcements and then I'm out because I got to go grocery shopping so I can prepare Thanksgiving. We got a couple of days. Actually, uh, by the time this airs, it'll be Thanksgiving Eve and I'm hosting. So (laughs) I'm talking a little fast because I I need to run to the grocery store. I'm looking forward to it though. It's always fun. Again, Cosmic Consciousness. Listen, go to the website uh, where you can learn more about this conference. It is in Australia. I know that I'm so delighted to say that we've, we've got some listeners there and uh, some viewers. Uh, I don't know where you are in this very, very large territory called Australia. Uluru, you will undoubtedly be familiar if you are there as to where it is. I don't know how accessible it is to you, but I think it's worth going. This is going to be a three-day extravaganza, uh, January 12th through the 14th, coming up in a few short weeks, really, five, six weeks or so. So I'll make sure to list the website so you can go and learn all about uh, about the conference and some of uh, the amazing speakers that will be um, also in attendance. A couple of them I can't confirm yet, so I'm not going to mention, but I hope I can soon. Uh, okay, so that's that. Uh, what's next? I'm not doing a show next week. Hmm, I'm not going to do a show next week, in part because I really have to pull the uh, 
the details of this presentation together, among other things. Among other things, let me tell you what else is going on. I'm just, you know, for someone that has always bragged about being not being a multitasker, I'll be damned if if I don't become one now because we got a lot of things going on. All good. Uh, I am also, or I should say, Higher Journeys is also teaming up this year with Conscious Life Expo. It's a 17th annual Conscious Life Expo that begins February 22nd. Of course, we will be in Los Angeles to cover it as usual. Uh, But this time we're doing something quite unique. I'm actually dedicating uh, some uh, interviews to speakers that will be presenting at the expo, of which there are many. Let me see if I can read some for you. They just put up their new website, which is beautiful, kind of a different uh, user experience than their previous website, although it was good. We've got, gosh, David Wilcock, Marianne Williamson speaking this year, Eric Von Danigan of Ancient Aliens and Chariots of the Gods fame, Deborah King, Nassim Harriman, my friend, Anita Morjani, oh gosh, Dr. Sue Mortar, uh, Danian Brinkley, another good friend. I can't wait. I love seeing Danian and his wife Kat every year. Oh gosh, Sonia Grace, Grant Cameron, Emery Smith, Billy Carson, David Adair, who I will be interviewing. He's one of the first I'll be interviewing for our special Conscious Life Expo lineup. Linda Moulton Howe, Jimmy Church, Paola Harris. Oh my gosh. Go to the website, ConsciousLifeExpo.com. You can check it out for yourself. And I think they'll probably be adding uh, several more. There's probably about 100 or so speakers, if not more. So when we return, I suspect we will be kicking in these special Conscious Life Expo pre-expo interviews. So you can learn a little bit more about the speakers. Uh, They'll maybe be teasing us a little bit with what they're going to be presenting at the expo. So stay tuned for that. Okay? (laughs) that's it folks listen thank you for your attention i hope uh, the topic that we brought up very briefly today is something that you will take some time to ponder as with so many things let's continue to explore the mystery shall we i do think it's well worth it until next time i will talk to you soon i'm alexis brooks 